everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Issue by Issue Crisis, a DC Comics completionist podcast. It's Friday. That means that it is the only podcast that I know of that is going through all of DC Comics history one issue at a time, starting from Crisis on Infinite Earths number one. I am your host, as always, Nick Byers. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. It's Friday. It's exciting. Everyone loves Friday. TGIF, you know. Thank God it's Friday. Uh Um, I do want to apologize again for last week, last Friday's episode of Crisis. I just, I started, if you listened, I started to recap uh, the the final issue of uh, America versus the Justice Society, but I just realized in that moment that that miniseries is so connected to itself that I would have to basically summarize the entire miniseries for that last issue to make sense. Maybe I'll I'll do a special episode eventually just recapping that entire miniseries, but it's basically just a rehash of the, a lot of the like bigger cases of the Justice Society. So we'll eventually get to those in All-Star Comics uh, and and the other Justice Society uh, storylines, timelines of, well, most of them, we won't get to all of them, but a lot of them, the Golden Age stuff. But again, I want to apologize that's my bad. I should didn't have done that. I shouldn't have done that. But I also shouldn't have. I guess I probably shouldn't have even included that mini series to begin with. So, say la vie. What are you gonna do? You know. Uh, but it's a new episode. You take that old episode. You throw it right in the garbage. It's done. It's old. This is the now. This is the present. So let's talk about this week's episode. This week's episode. We are going to quickly summarize. Uh, Arian, Lord of Atlantis, number 30, and I'll explain why in a bit. We're going to do Detective Comics, number 549. We're going to do Jonah Hex, number 90, and we're going to do Tales of the Legion, number 322. So, uh, but as always, let's set the scene. There is no scene setting. That was covered last episode. We're still on January 24th, 1985. So, no setting the scene, no real-world history. Uh, so we can get into the actual issues straight from the jump. So let's do it. So our first issue is going to be Aryan Lord of Atlantis number 30. And I'm only going to summarize it somewhat, somewhat quickly, maybe a few minutes. Because my argument for that is Lord uh, Aryan Lord of Atlantis, his whole world, is somewhat connected to the Warlord world um, from the Warlord comics. Uh, it has its own sort of universe and sort of uh, characters and all that kind of stuff. It has very little to do with the actual DC Comics multiverse, other than the fact that it is in it. Uh, so I could take the time to explain all the intricacies of all these characters, uh, or I could do what I did with Warlord and just kind of skip it. But Arian has a somewhat important, or at least somewhat prevalent, place in Crisis on Infinite Earths. We saw him in Crisis on Infinite Earths number one. So I'm going to do more than what I did with Warlord. I just completely skipped Warlord because of reasons I've said. But I'm going to to summarize Aryan Lord of Atlantis number 30, and we'll do that for the rest of his issues. He's only got five more after this. I believe his series stops at number 35 and then goes to Crisis on Infinite Earths. So um, don't be confused that he's back in Atlantis. He doesn't go to Crisis on Infinite Earths until the end of his series. So, we're just at different times. You know, continuity. It's weird. But let's talk about this uh, this issue. It was released January 24th, 1985, uh, with a cover date of April 1985. We've already met Lord Arian uh, of Atlantis. Uh, there's there's um, supporting characters in this issue and I'll just explain quickly the only two that really matter. There's Lady Chian, who is uh, Lord Arian's lover and partner in their, you know, adventuring. And then there is a Wind, W-Y-Y-N-D-E, who is another friend of uh, Lord Arian who has gone missing uh, recently. So that'll be, you know, a plot point. But uh, let's get into the the behind-the-scenes, the production side of this issue. It was written by Paul Kupperberg, artist Jan or Jan Dersema, lettered by Andy Kubert, and colored by Robert Key LaRose. 
Uh, so let's just summarize it really quickly uh, so we can move on to Detective Comics number 549. Atlantis is being besieged by unnatural storms. The source guiding the storms is traced to a metallic tower on the edge of the city. Arian and Chian enter the tower via, via an underground passageway. Inside, they are attacked by a group of beast men. One of them is, turns out to be, their friend Wind, uh, who has been missing. When the attack by the beast men fails, the scientist who had created them sends robotic drones, drones to kill them. Arian uses his magic to cause feedback within the drones. The computer's guidance system explodes, killing the scientist. Arian then sets out to find a way to restore Wind's humanity. So, uh, that would have taken, I think, a clip of time for me to explain. Uh, I'm going to stop making excuses for myself. This is my show. Uh, I'll do it however I want. So, um, so let's move on to something more in the uh, actual DC multiverse. Uh, Detective Comics number 549, uh, released January 24th, 1985. Cover date, April 1985. We have three debuts to the podcast in this issue. Uh, one in the, the A story, the uh, Batman story, and one in the B story, the backup with Green Arrow and Black Canary. So, in the Batman story, we have the one, the only, the the gruffest cop you'll ever meet, Harvey Bullock from the uh, Gotham City Police Department. Uh, we learn a lot about Harvey in this Oh, I should say, sorry, Harvey Bullock originally debuted in Detective Comics number 441 on March 28th, 1974. Now, Harvey Bullock is one of those characters that I've always known is around in, I mean, in Batman the Animated Series, in a lot of different Batman iterations, he's there in some form or, or the other. So I've just always thought he's around, but he's only, at this point, he's only, you know, 10 years old as a character. So that's that's pretty cool. And we we learn a lot about Harvey and his internal self in this uh Detective Comics story. Uh it's 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 pretty good. Uh it's 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 pretty good. I I learned a lot about Harvey Bullock. At least this iteration of Heart of Harvey Bullock. Things can change after Crisis on Infinite Earths or Zero Hour Infinity Crisis or Final Crisis or Flashpoint or uh, Rebirth or all that kind of stuff. So this, at least this iteration of Harvey Bullock, we learn a lot about. Uh, Green Arrow and Black Canary both debut on the podcast in the backup story of this Detective Comics. Green Arrow of Earth 1, I should say, not Green Arrow of Earth 2, Green Arrow of Earth 1, debuted in Adventure Comics number 246 on January 30th, 1958. Earth 2 Green Arrow will be meeting, uh, I think, in 1941, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Black Canary, Earth 1, debuted in Justice League of America number 75 on September 11th, 1969. Now, saying Earth 1 Black Canary is a little bit of a misnomer because, spoiler alert for a character that came around in, in you know, what what is it, like 50 years ago? Uh, Black Canary on Earth-1, Dinah Laurel Lance, the Black Canary that we all typically think of, at this point in time is actually is actually the daughter. So it's the daughter of the Earth-2 Black Canary who lived her entire life in uh, the Thunderbolts dimension, like the fourth dimension. But her mother... Dinah Drake Lance, who is the Earth 2 Black Canary, after a, a battle she was uh, she was going to be going to Earth 1, she was going to make a new life on Earth 1, uh, she is injured and she is dying, but she wants to see her daughter for one last time. So Superman, as he is bringing her from Earth 2 to Earth 1, shows her her daughter, uh, who she thought was dead this whole time, and the Thunderbolt then... Uh, transfers Dinah Drake Lance's memories onto her daughter so that she thinks that she's her mother, but she's actually her daughter, and then she goes to Earth-1, and then she falls in love with Oliver Queen on Earth-1. Uh, and that's that's stories old this time, of course. So that's really confusing. So saying Earth-1 is a little bit of, of a misnomer because she's actually from Earth-2, and she's actually not who she thinks she is. So I wonder if that will come up uh, before she's wiped out of existence. Who knows? 
So uh, let's get to the production side of the this issue. Uh, the Batman story was written by Deg Deg Doug Monch M O E N C H, penciled by Patrick R. Broderick, inked by Robert Allen Smith, lettered by Ben Oda, and colored by Adrian Roy Orwa. Uh, Green Arrow, the Green Arrow ba- backup, uh, was written by the great Alan Moore, uh, drawn and all, all the art was done by Klaus. Jansen or Jansen or Johnson, depending on how you say words, uh, and lettered by Todd Klein. So let's get into the issue. Let's start with the cover. It it it, it talks a big game. Uh, this this Detective Comics cover. It's got a an action balloon that says the Shocker of the Year, and another one that says all new action, all new thrills. Uh, and it says Detective Comics presents the Batman together again with. Harvey Bullock, and we have a sort of blown up uh, version of Batman and Harvey uh, kind of standing side by side. Batman's doing sort of a pose with his hand, and Harvey's shooting a gun. And they're sort of superimposed over a scene on a city street where Batman and Harvey are beating up some thugs, but then also there is an image of Batman driving in the Batmobile. It's a very busy cover, and it makes sense to the story that we're going to be reading, but Harvey doesn't actually ever shoot a gun in this issue, so kind of uh, false advertising for that. But let's get into the actual story. And uh, like I said, it'll be mostly it's mostly Harvey Bullock centered. Uh, Batman does show up, but very very little. Like I think only the last couple pages. So we we go to police headquarters in Gotham City. Harvey is doing his kind of Harvey thing around the office. He's eating constantly, it seems like, kind of making a mess, uh, being his sort of gruff, demanding self, asking like, oh, you know, how do I contact Batman? How do I contact Batman? I got some tips for him. I got to contact Batman. He goes into Commissioner Gordon's office and says, I got some tidbits here that will help the Batman clean up Dr. Fang's leftover mob. And I want to get in touch with him. And Gordon says, well, I'm sorry, Harvey. The bat signal doesn't really work during the day. And he says, well, it can wait, right? And Harvey says, ah, sure, it can wait, commish. But why should it if I can find him now? Um, But then Harvey says, eh, it's fine. I wanted to knock off early anyways today. There's a a revival festival going on at the, the Regency. Different double feature every night. All classics, so... Uh, a bunch of old black and white movies being played at the Regency. Uh, don't mind if I do. Uh, Harvey, I learned that Harvey is a sort of kindred spirit to myself and a lot of people in this one because he has a real love and uh, appreciation for classic cinema. Uh, so uh, as as Harvey leaves, Commissioner Gordon is thinking, an overwhelmingly curious man, and why do I always feel there's more to him? Another side he never lets anyone else see. And then um, Harvey's making his way home, still kind of doing his his you know gruff cop shtick, kind of you know talking to people. I mean, a lot of people don't have a lot of respect for Harvey. It seems uh, they kind of talk about him behind his back as he leaves. He he gets into his car and his door almost falls off the car. He's like, ah, oh, gosh, I gotta buy a new hinge. Gotta throw good cash after bad, uh, which is an expression that I I guess I don't really understand. Uh, and then once he gets to his apartment building, his neighborhood, he his door just falls all the way off. So Harvey Harvey's uh, situation, money-wise, is clearly not good. Otherwise, he'd have a nicer car with the door that stays on. Uh, outside his building, he sees this this group of four sort of thugs, ruffians, if you will, ne'er-do-wells, having a fight, like a fist fight. And so they're punching each other. And so Harvey steps in. And he says, don't you guys know that the east side is my turf? Now go, get up the street. This is my block. And so he kind of he kind of kicks kicks the snot out of a, a few of them. And one gets very, very angry, and he's getting mad at him. He says, hey, we're all the same gang. This is just a friendly fight. And uh, and Harvey says, well, there's no such thing, genius. And so he kind of, he says, get out. He says, get, get off my block. He kicks him, he kicks him in the butt, makes him fall down. And uh, the guy stands up, and he's got this really, really, like, angry look on his face, blood coming out of his nose. Doesn't say anything, but just stares, just, like, 
with hatred as Harvey walks away. So Harvey then goes into his building, and the hallway that he walks down is not very nice. It's covered in graffiti, and the plaster's all chipped, and he says it may smell sour, but it's still home, sweet home. So it's not a very nice building or a nice neighborhood that that Harvey lives in. Uh, he opens his door to his apartment, and we see the title for this issue, and it's called Dr. Harvey and Mr. Bullock. Now, when I read that as the title of this story, I was like, oh, no, Harvey's going to, like, some sort of science experiment is going to turn him into, like, a Dr. Hyde. No, Mr. Mis- Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, that's it. Uh, but then I forgot that that's not the Silver Age anymore, uh, so that's not going to happen. Um, it's more of a, uh, we don't find out. So he once he walks inside, a chain a change comes over him. He's no longer this gruff police, you know, de- police lieutenant, sergeant, detective, whatever he is, with like a chip on his shoulder. He's a very like calm and appreciative guy, and we see on his walls are movie posters uh we have a a charlie chaplin movie poster we have uh uh, the public enemy uh movie poster and he you know he lovingly cleans it off there's a smudge on the frame on the glass and he lovingly cleans it off and he walks up to his poster of the uh, cecil b demille uh, cleopatra movie and he says he says or he thinks this is all you know internal thoughts he says clara you're still a doll while liz is simply fat now, if you don't know movie history, uh, that won't make any sense, but it, I I do know what he's talking about. So he's talking about the star of the Cecil B. DeMille, Cleopatra, who is actually Claudette Colbert, not, or or Colbert, I don't, I think, well, she's French, so it would be Colbert. Uh, he calls her Clara, but her name is Claudette, so that's a misnomer. And the Liz he's talking about is Elizabeth Taylor, who stars as Cleopatra in the 1963 version of the movie. He has a, uh, a, Bella Lugosi poster of him in, in Dracula, uh, and he kind of makes a comment, ah, Bella, I hope the darkness is better to you now that it's final, because Bella Lugosi is uh, dead at this point in time in 1985. We then see sort of snippets of the other posters that he has. He has a Veronica Lake uh, poster. I can't find what movie it is because, you know, some of the words are cut off, but we also see a Casablanca with um, uh, Humphrey Bogart and Ingrid Bergman on the on the. Uh, we have a picture of the uh, German film directed by Fritz Lang, M, a really great sort of murder mystery, public conspiracy, mob mentality movie that's really, really good. Um, And then suddenly the phone rings and Harvey's like, oh, nuts. So he answers the phone and he makes a joke. He makes a joke. He's he's got so much movie knowledge. There's so many movie references in this issue, and it made me smile every time I read one. Because he when he answers the phone, he says, "Sorry, wrong number. Barbara Stanwyck ain't here." Barbara Stanwyck stars in a film called "Sorry, Wrong Number," uh, so that's that's really great. Um, uh, it's the de- it's the desk sergeant at the at police headquarters saying that there's someone that wants to talk to Harvey, but he doesn't want to talk to him over the phone, so. Uh, so if, if Harvey could come back to the police headquarters and, and talk to him, and Harvey says, uh, fine. I mean, I, I, I got, I got my, mo- I got my double feature. So, I mean, I guess I can, if I, if I hurry, I can come down to headquarters as he's acquiescing to the desk sergeant's request. He kind of quotes the line or kind of a little bit quotes the line from Gone with the Wind, uh, Rhett Butler saying, you know, frankly, my dear, I don't give a expletive. Uh, he says that on the, he says, frankly, Murphy, I don't give a dang, but he doesn't say dang. He says a swear, um, but he's going to, he'll be on his way. So he's heading back down to police headquarters and 30 minutes later, that's quite the commute. That sucks. Uh, he's back at police headquarters. And he's like, okay, where's the person? I'm, I'm missing the cartoons and the coming attractions for my double feature. Where's this, you know, little twerp that wants to talk to me. And uh, the desk sergeant says he's right over there on the, bench and he points over there and there's nobody there and harvey is kind of confused and so is the desk sergeant Dustin's like like, he's gone uh i guess he couldn't wait bullock and he's like sorry to grab you down here uh and harvey's like well who was he like what did he look like and the desk sergeant says i don't know like young but but full grown and tough looking a gang member i think 
And Harvey's like, well, what are his colors? And, and the desk sergeant says, well, I can't remember. Maybe something to do with pirates, crossbones, or um, something like that. And Harvey says, the Skull Smashers. And I forgot to tell you this while, he was, while it happened, but the fight he broke up was between four members of the Skull Smashers. So that's probably that would probably have hit more if you had known that. Um, and the desk sergeant's like, yeah, yeah, that's it, the Skull Smashers. And so Harvey, you know, kind of thinks for a second and then bolts out the door. He jumps into his car, which still doesn't have a driver's door, and just races back across the Gotham Bay Bridge to back to his neighborhood and back into his to his apartment. But his apartment has been broken into and vandalized. Uh, his posters are smashed. Um, probably ruined as well, uh, and the skull smashers have graffitied all over their wall, all over his walls, because it's 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 very interesting. The first time Harvey comes into his apartment, his the outside of his door is covered in graffiti, but the inside is pristine, and so it's a very very shocking sort of hard line in in Harvey's life. Outside of this room, outside of this apartment, I am a tough city cop. Inside this, I'm a man who enjoys his cinema. He has a the things in life that he appreciates, uh, and he's he's a lot deeper than what he may seem like he is. But now that's ruined. the The line, the barrier between his inner self and his outer self, has been crossed by the Skull Smashers, and so now uh, it says, "And with the destruction of the fantasy comes the death of Harvey the Man, as he transit transits bitterly to the rebirth of." Bullock, the cop. So uh, they're going to get it. We then cut to an alley where we see the guy who Harvey sort of embarrassed earlier by like kicking him uh, so he falls over, trying to hide a can of spray paint in a, in a garbage can. And Harvey comes up behind him and be like, ah, I bet you've run out of spray paint plenty of times, but I also bet you ain't usually so squeamish about littering. And the guy turns around and is like, <gasps> Bullock. And, he's, and Bullock's like, why the change? That spray can don't really matter, you know? Because I've already seen all the evidence I need. And we see Harvey Bullock. And he's rolling up his sleeves, uh, getting ready to uh, beat this guy up. And, you know, this guy's like, oh, you got me wrong, Bullock. I don't, I don't do, didn't do nothing. I was just back here smoking a joint. And Harvey says, ah, that'll be the day. I'm taking you in, punk. Even if I have to smash your skull. Which is a fun little reference to him being... In the Skull Smasher gang. Uh, well, this this kid is like, well, you, oh, yeah? Well, first you got to beat me. And he pulls out a switchblade. And he's like, ha I've got the upper hand now. So they go back and forth. And with each sort of blow that uh, Harvey lands, the, the narration. I'm just going to read the narration because I think it's really, really poignant. Like, the way this page is set up is very, very good. And really drives home what has been lost by Harvey. So... The neatness of the black and white world is long behind him now, defiled, desecrated, divided, and destroyed. But if this dead-end alley is not painted in muddled grays, it is nevertheless stained red. And after each swing by Harvey, we see a flash of one of his posters um, destroyed uh, by the Skull Smasher gangs. We've got... Uh, on the word defiled, the Cecil B. DeMille's Cleopatra poster comes up and it's got graffiti all over it. On desecrated, we have um, the son of the sheriff. I don't know who directs that one. Rudolph Ven Valentino, I think. Uh, and, and it's got graffiti all over it. And then on divided and destroyed, we see, coincidentally, the poster for John Barrymore's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, which is obviously referenced in the title of this comic. And I just think it's really, really, it's a really good page, I think, um, to, to show the emotion that Harvey's going through and what he's thinking about what he lost. So he's kind of really worked this kid over good. Like he's, blood is coming out of his mouth quite a bit. Uh, and and the kid looks up and he says, uh, oh, it looks like I was wrong, Bullock. First, you got to beat all of us every last Skull Smasher down to a man. And we look up and we see the entire Skull Smasher gang standing at the end of this alley, blocking Bullock's way uh, out. Um, so, it seems like Harvey Bullock is in, is in trouble. But, 
out from the shadows, from the top of a building, comes Batman, who says, I heard you wanted me. And Harvey says, not really, Batman, nothing I can't handle myself, but stick around anyways. You might learn something. And the Skull Smashers, they're still feeling pretty confident, because it's a, it's a bunch of them against two of them. Plus, they would get mad street cred if they took out a cop and Batman. So, the fight, the final brawl is about to go down, but before it does, Harvey makes two more movie references. He says, maybe there ain't no fog, but something tells me this is going to be the beginning of a beautiful friendship, Batman. So that one is a reference to the final line of the 1942 film, one of my favorite films of all time, Casablanca, uh, starring Humphrey Bogart and Ingrid Bergman. Uh, and in that shot, there is uh, the two two of the main characters, uh, Humphrey Bogart's character and the police sergeant, the head of the police uh, in, in Casablanca. They walk off into the fog that is surrounding them uh, to go and become freedom fighters uh, against the Nazis in North Africa. And then Harvey says, you want to play Butch or Sundance, which is obviously a reference to uh, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, a very great film starring Paul Newman and Robert Redford. I would, I would check it out if you are interested in that. Uh, and, and with that, Batman throws the first kick right into a dude's face. Harvey punches a guy in the face. They're both, they're just taking down dudes left and right, these two, these two heavy hitters. Uh, they're making, I feel like they're making references as they do it, but I'm not sure what they are. So, so yeah, I'm not going to bring them up because if I don't know what they are, then it won't be helpful. So they're, they're beating up all of these guys. You know, Harvey grabs a board at one point in time. Uh, Batman, of course, is just, just annihilating dudes left and right. And uh, they finally, you know, take them all out. And... Batman says, neatly done, Bullock, but hardly a mess to be proud of. And Bullock says, why not? All, All's we did is mop up the alley, all the way from the dead end back to the m m mean street. Um, but, Har but the narration says, but the bravado is belied by both tightening throat and trembling voice. So you can tell that this has really affected Harvey. Uh, you, you don't know if it's the... If it's the losing all of his, you know, his apartment being destroyed or the fight itself and the fact that he could have died. But uh, this has really greatly affected him. And Batman asks him, what did you want to see me about? And um, Harvey's things, uh, Harvey says, it can wait, Batman. Right now I got to go pick up some pieces. But only, And then the narration starts. But only three steps are taken toward the shattered worlds of his secret place before his fists finally open. And he pivots, returning to the alley whose muddled grays have been streaked and spattered with with red. And Harvey says, excuse me, Batman, but I always forget what was real. I almost forgot what was real, like the fact that no one's all good or all bad. And he offers his handkerchief to the initial kid uh, that sort of started this whole thing. And he says, come on, son, let's go talk about our good sides. And the final narration says, far from his threshold, Harvey Bullock has just made the most profound change of all. And to hell with the double feature. Which, like, hey, let's not go too far. A double feature is nice. I love a good double feature. And then we see a, a sort of a little short caption box that says, next issue, the spider's ninth leg. Bum, bum, bum. So that is the Batman story from Detective Comics. I thought it was really good. It wasn't what I expected at all from the title or from what I expect from Batman comics, uh, typically for the most part. But I, I did learn a lot about at least this version of Harvey Bullock and, and that he's a lot deeper than his sort of caricature aspect would make you think, which I think is the, the, I mean, the point of all characters, right? They're all deeper than we think by what they show on the outside. Um, but I think it was a really good, really good, uh, really good story, and not just because there's a ton of movie references in it. So, so let's move on to the backup story, the Green Arrow, Black Canary backup called Night Olympics. Uh, and so this is basically the story of Green Arrow and Black Canary, just on a night on, night in on patrol. So it starts off with a guy. 
uh, breaking into a, an electronics store and uh, stealing a television. But all the narration is sort of Olympics themed. And so it starts off with the crowd was big and noisy, a slow technicolor stampede. It was a good gate like every other night. There was no torchbearer and no lighting of traditional fires. Nonetheless, a clear signal was given as a rock goes through this electronics window. The first event was the 400-meter dash with television set and first stage drug withdrawal. And we see a the guy who presumably threw the rock running down the street with the television in his hands as a green arrow, like, schlunks by his face into uh, a telephone pole uh, in front of him. The guy... Uh, is is confronted by the man who shot the Green Arrow, uh, Green Arrow, <laughs> and uh, Green Arrow is is saying that he's going to give him he can he can have the quiet moral instruction or the noisy moral instruction, and, and so, uh, but before Green Arrow can even start giving his moral instruction, the guy sort of drops the television, breaking it on the ground, and starts screaming and screaming and screaming and screaming. And starts slamming his head into the ground. He, like, kneels down on his knees and starts slamming his head into the ground. And Green Arrow is, like, shocked and confused. Like, what are you doing? What are you doing? You're going you're gonna to hurt yourself. I mean, possibly more than I was going to hurt you. And so he kind of grabs him to, to stop him from hurting himself. And the guy's just, like, shaking back and forth in, in, a, in a complete fugue state, uh, uh, real conniption. And so uh, Green Arrow drags him over to a payphone and calls 911, presumably. He says, hello, hospital. And uh, he's, you know, the guy and him are both in the phone booth. So the guy's, like, headbutting him, like, with the back of his head. And and, and Green Arrow's trying to call for help. Uh, we then cut to a different alleyway. And we see uh, the legs of Black Canary. And she's leaning up against a wall as these two other thieves round a corner and she, and she says well boys and one of them says hey man it's only a chick let's bust her head in but the other one says oh listen man i don't know i think we ought to surrender you know and the other guy's like what um because obviously she's a woman so it's easy to beat her up um my and the guy who said that they should surrender says my brother you know my brother Artie, he got beaten up by batgirl this one time she broke his nose, man. All the all the guys started making remarks, and he had to leave town. And the other guy's like, Artie did? And so they both put down the electronics that they're carrying, and they're like, oh, I don't know, man. I guess you're right. I don't want to be beaten up by no super bimbo. Let's give up. And uh, they right, right before they run off, uh, they say, we give up. Or I guess they don't run off. Uh, before they surrender, they say, we give up, Wonder Woman. And Black Canary's like, Wonder Woman? Um... Then we cut to a place called uh, Sutter and Resnick Specialist Hardware. And a guy is talking inside um, about how good this one guy is with shooting arrows. The guy that's in the office with him. And he's like, you've got a talent, man. You could be up there, you know. But you need a name and a costume. Listen, I know a guy who does costumes. He ain't done much in the last couple of years. But listen, one time he made suits for all the big guys. Mirror Master. Captain Cold. I remember he was proud of that Captain Cold suit. So this is clearly a a villain's sort of hardware um, supplies sort of provider. And so he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I know what we'll call you. We'll call you Arrow Man. And the guy's like, yeah, um, yeah, uh, maybe I should get a costume, you know, a name, uh, but not Arrow Man. But I agree with what you said earlier. If you're doing, if you're going to do a thing, do it right. And he shoots this guy in the back with an arrow, and the arrow goes through him and the door that he was standing in front of. And the guy um, just kind of stands over the dead body, uh, and he's got a he's got a black mohawk uh, with with the sides shaved. I don't know if I've seen him before, but this is only part one. Night Olympics Part Two is take takes place in. Uh, Detective Comics 550, so it'll be a while before we get to part two. But, uh, so this, it'll be, hopefully be explained. We then cut back to the Night Olympics. Uh, there were winners and there were losers. Those that were contenders and those that were disqualified. And we kind of see, uh, we see Green Arrow as the police and the ambulance has arrived. 
and it's explained to Green Arrow that there is like a certain criminals are what cops called superheroes, or they are affected by what's called superhero psychouts. And basically, if they're ever confronted by a superhero, they just basically go into like a psychotic fit, uh, basically like this, like this guy uh, did. Um, because like he got he it happened. His name is Joey. Uh, he's had a very unlucky career. Uh, because apparently earlier this summer he was picked up by Firestorm while raiding a pharmacy, and then two years before that, Metamorpho Metamorpho grabbed him during a bank job, and like Metamorpho is a, a compared to Green Arrow is a heavy hitter, and so is you know Firestorm. So plus Metamorpho is not the most normal looking superhero. Let's just say that. Uh, and so Black Canary, having finished up with her portion of this crime fighting, comes back and, and you know, says, yeah, I, I, I picked up my other two. And uh, it's just something about crooks these days. They're kind of pathetic. And Green Arrow says, funny, I was just thinking the same thing myself. You know, superheroes have really screwed things up for the criminal classes in this country. And Black Canary is like, wasn't that the idea? And he says, well, yeah, but it's like all the fights gone out of the ordinary criminal. Ordinary criminals just can't compete anymore. And uh, Black Canary says, hey, don't sound so depressed about it. There's still plenty of extraordinary criminals. And Green Arrow says, right, that's my whole point. It's like Darwinism or something. We're gradually weeding out all the just plain average goons, gradually improving the strain until only the flat-out dangerous psychos are left in the running, which is a fair point. Because, like, in, let's, talk about, let's talk about the DC Comics universe. It wasn't, it's not like when Batman started being Batman, the Joker and the Penguin and Catwoman and Scarecrow and Clayface and all these guys were already running around. No, no, no. They came up as a result of superheroes being around. You have to up your game as a criminal if you expect to get anywhere against superheroes. And so Green Arrow makes a really, really good point there. Uh, and it's a point that, you know, superhero fans talk about all the time. It's a it's a you know a topic that will never be put to rest. Um and so Black Canary says I guess that the heavyweights are getting heavier, but we're still winning, and they're still losing. Some ra Same race, different pace. And Green Arrow says, yeah, maybe, but it isn't just the pace that's increased. It's the tension. And at the end of this conversation, we see the guy who has the bow and arrow that killed the, the guy at the hardware specialty you know, place, and he is ready an arrow, and after Green Arrow says, it's the tension, he releases the arrow down towards Green Arrow and Black Canary, and then it says, to be continued. So that'll be covered in part two of Night Olympics in Detective Comics number 550. Uh, also a very good, uh, a very philosophical sort of backup, and obviously backups are only like six pages, so they can't really do a lot. But I think it, I don't know, it asked, it asked a lot of questions, brought up a lot of points that are really prevalent in superhero fiction so i thought that that was really good i mean what do you expect from alan moore he's a very cerebral kind of guy uh but that's going to do it for detective comics number 549 so let's move on to uh jonah hex number 90 uh of course as as it always been released january 24th 1985 with a cover date of april 1985 and just one debut in this one uh of course that would be the eponymous hero Bounty Hunter, uh, Jonah Hex from Earth One. He debuted in All Star Western number ten on December seventh, nineteen seventy one. Uh, and on the production side of this issue, we have write written by Michael L. Fleischer. Flesher. Uh, artist and colorist is Gray Morrow, and letterer is Duncan Andrews. So let's get into it. And as we so often do, let's start with the. Cover. The cover says a lot about what the the story is going to be about, even though it doesn't necessarily depict a scene that occurs in this story. So we are at a funeral in the cover. Uh, a man is in a casket. He is dead. That's typically 
people's status when they're laying in caskets, um, unless you're Daredevil, in that one really bad version uh, with Ben Affleck, where he sleeps in a coffin full of water. Uh, and standing in front of the casket is an Asian woman, and she is crouched down. Uh, she's wearing purple clothes. She says, oh, Jonah, how horrible. Who could have possibly wanted to shoot a fine man like Jeremiah Hart in the back? And Jonah Hex is standing next to her with his, you know, always always on his face sort of snarl uh, due to his, his facial deformity. Uh, and off to the side behind Jonah Hex is a silver-haired woman or a white-haired woman uh, poking out from behind a curtain, pointing a gun at the back of Jonah Hex's head. So uh, that's that's very, very interesting. I will say... A funeral does not take place in this issue, and Joan Hex does not go to a funeral. But all three of those characters do show up. Actually, four if you count the guy in the casket. So, it starts out, the actual issue, the the issue is called Starlight, Star Bright. Which, first star I see tonight. Which, now that I read that again, part of that story makes a little bit more sense. Part of this story, I should say, frankly. Or rather, um, so Hex is, uh, you know, loading up his horse, putting his sad- saddling his horse, uh, whose name we don't know. And this woman wearing a purple dress comes out and says, Mr. Hex, this is outrageous. You put that horse away and get back inside that house this instant. Because they're in the West, which I mean, I'm from technically the West as well. And I don't talk like that. So it's that's a mean caricature what you've done, Nick. Um, she tells him that Dr. Bierstein said as well. Oh, sorry. She says that Jonah Hex knows what Dr. Bierstein said as well as she does. You are simply in no condition to. And then she gets cut off. This is a reference to the last couple of issues of Jonah Hex. In Jonah Hex number 88, he is shot at the end by Emmy Lou Hartley, who is a, a, a somewhat friend of his. It was an accident uh, during a robbery. Uh, that she was uh, doing with three other people, and Jonah Hex came in to stop it. And so she, on instinct, shot and shot him. And then the uh, issue after that, he was still dealing with uh, those industries, industries injuries uh, while he was staying at Mrs. Crowley's boarding house, which is the place that he is leaving at this moment. Jonah explains, I just can't... I just, he's, his, every single one of his speech bubbles are written trying to give him a southern accent uh i think if you let we'll do some pronunciations and see if it sounds right coming out i just can't lay around here no more mrs crowley i just can't that's not that's not bad that sounds you know uh when you think of like uh foghorn leghorn or uh like bayou people it's like ah like that's i instead of i it's i i just can't i just can't i just can't yeah, I think it does a good job. Uh, and he says, not when I got me a close friend who's cut off. Um, and he's talking about Emmy Lou Hartley, who is uh, mixed up with some bad people at the moment. Uh, and Jonah Hex doesn't uh, hold it against her, uh, presumably, that she shot him. Uh, so uh, Jonah rides off. And uh, we then cut to, uh, meanwhile, on the outskirts of another western town many miles away, it, we see Marshall uh, Hart, Marshall Jeremiah Hart, or J.D. Hart, and he is uh, doing a, some shooting with these kids. Uh, they throw up a coin, and he shoots it three times before it hits the ground, and it's pretty cool. Uh, you know, uh, On the last panel, we see the coin. It's got three bullet holes through it. Um, that's pretty good. He's a pretty good marksman. And the kids are having a great time. They're asking for more, like, do it again, do it again sort of situations. When uh, a white or silver-haired woman uh, rides up on a horse and uh, one of the boys says, uh, Wowee, Marshall, that was fabulous. I bet no one else in the world could. And he's cut off by this woman who says, Coins are easy, little boy. They don't shoot back. And uh, Jeremiah Hart looks around and says, who? And she says, you know who I am, don't you, Marshall? And he says, why no, I'm, no, why no, ma'am? 
I don't believe I... She cuts him off. She says, My name's Ames. Silver Ames. Last month in Abilene, I outdrew Kingfish Belden. People said he was the third fastest gun in the country. They say you're the second fastest. That's what I've come to find out. She says, At the count of three. And at this point in time, Hart sort of turns around and says, I'm, I'm sorry to disappoint you, a lady. I, like, I don't shoot... I don't like get into gunfights without any purpose to them uh, like they need to have a reason and also the second is is i just i don't i i can't uh pull a gun on a woman uh, and he's like all right come on kids and a a that's sexist uh women are just as able to have guns pulled on them as men so you know let's think about that feminism equality um but in this entire time she's still been counting she said at the count of three and she started with one she started with two, and then when she got to three, she shot him in the back three times, and he falls down, and the kids are, are yelling, they're like, Marshall, Marshall, uh, and she rides her, her horse away um, like a coward. Uh, hours later, we're back with Jonah Hex, and he's riding through uh, what's to be seems to be like a canyon, a rocky uh, outcropping of some kind, and so he's, he's on the trail of Emmy Lou. Uh, but he says it's uh, picking up Emmy Lou's trail after all this time is to be just a little bit like looking for fly specks in the pepper mill. But I ain't worried. Uh, so he's he's it's been a it's been a few days since Emmy Lou was on, in that bank robbery uh, and shot Jonah Hex. So her, her trail is likely to have gone cold. But um, at that moment, a sort of um, I guess I don't, landslide, I guess it would be, uh, like the Fleetwood Mac song, uh, a landslide occurs and him and his horse are toppled off the side of this canyon and, uh, you know, Jonah tries to, tries to get his lasso out and lasso like a, a rocky protrusion of the canyon wall, uh, but he can't quite reach it and, him and his horse fall to the bottom of the canyon. He lands on his horse. His horse appears to be dead, but so does Jonah Hex. So that's not good. Later, we're at uh, the the business or the building of Lucas Zuvembi Undertaker. Uh, and a woman is being shown, the woman from the cover is being shown uh, the body, a body with three bullet holes in it. And she starts sobbing and she yells, Jeremiah! And and the sheriff holds her back and says, uh, "Just you know, I, I I wouldn't go near the body just yet, Mei Ling, uh, until until the doc has a chance to patch it up, you know, bullet holes and all." And uh, Mei Ling begins to to shout, uh, "Men, I I hate all of you. Your your love of guns, your violence, your..." And the sheriff stops and says, "In plain fact, ma'am, I'm afraid it wasn't a man what did this to the marshal." It was a gal. And then we cut to uh, the, the woman, Ames, who we learn is named Silver Ames. And I don't know if that's on account of her hair because we see flashbacks of her as a child. And she also has a sort of white silver hair. So maybe she was born that way. And that's where she got her first name uh, or nickname. Uh, she's thinking she's sitting uh, in front of a fire and uh, thinking about uh, heart the man she just shot she said he's such a coward a spineless contemptible coward so spineless that he wouldn't even go for his gun um and then she says my father may he rest in peace was right a man ain't worth spit in this he here land unless he can find his way around a gun uh, and we cut to a flashback where silver's telling her father but i don't i'm not a man pa and i and guns scare me which like hey we got to respect, you have to have a healthy fear of weapons, you know? And his, her dad is saying, you better, you better get unscared really quick. Because how long do you think that the cattlemen are going to leave us to graze our sheep in peace if, if we don't have firearms, if I'm not always walking around with my six shooter on my side? And he tells her, he tells her, you better learn to use a gun, Silver, because one of these days I'm liable to be counting on you to back me up and she's she's thinking to herself i should have listened but she didn't so she didn't learn to shoot guns 
until the fateful day when uh, cattlemen came and they said that Mr. Broxton, the person who owns this land, or something of the sort, um, warned Mr. Ames, Silver's father, what would happen if he didn't clear off the land. Uh, and he didn't clear off the land. So they just, they all pull out their guns and they just shoot him so many times. And Silver is in time inside doing the dishes. And when she runs, sees this and runs out screaming for her dad and seeing that her dad is dead. Then after that, she um, sort of dedicates her life to becoming the fastest gun and deadliest gun in the entire West. So she's she does practice shooting. She really gets comfortable with guns. She goes after Broxton's hired gunslingers uh, and shoots all of them dead. Uh, she, she shoots a, a bunch of the quote-unquote fastest guns in the West, Eddie Perrins, Bart Harris, Kingfisher Belden, who we heard about, and then finally J.D. Hart. And now there's only one man left worth fighting. And once I outgun him, the whole world will know I'm the fastest gun alive. But guess what, Silver? That's not going to bring your dad back. And you know what it's going to do? It's going to put you in prison for just doing straight up murders a bunch. Like this is serious. This is like serial killers type stuff. It's like, hey, you've done nothing to me and I've done nothing to you, but I'm going to shoot you for some sort of ranking, I guess. Okay. Uh, all right, Silver. Maybe you should have gotten your priorities straight uh, sometime. Elsewhere, we cut back to Jonah Hex uh, laying on his dead horse. Uh, and he is awoken by uh, a rainstorm. He, uh, he says, every bone in my body, or in my body, broke or close to broke. And he gets up and says the least that he can do is... is get himself out of the rain and go into this cave. But I mean, with just his luck that he's been having on his no good, terrible, really bad day, uh, would be that there'd be a grizzly bear in, or a grizzly bear convention, he says, in this cave. And he walks inside and he's, he's happy to find that there's no bears. But wait a minute, what's that noise? It's a cougar or a mountain lion or a puma, depending on where you're from and what you call them. We call them mountain lions where I'm from. Uh, a place where there are no mountains. Uh, it comes down from the ceiling and just attacks him. We then cut away, before any of that action happens, to a uh, a certain dilapidated farmhouse many miles distant from there. Uh, a man named Brett is walking in asking where Pigtails is. And uh, two of the other girls that are there say, oh, she's sulking. And he's like, sulking about what? And uh, she says, skulking about that scar-faced bounty hunter she shot during that holdup in Red Dog. Which is a reference to Jonah Hill 88, meaning that Pigtails is Emmy Lou Hartley, uh, the person who shot Jonah X. And he's, and Brett says, oh, well, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll deal with this. So he knocks on the door and he says, Emmy, it's me, Brett, I'm coming in. And he opens the door and says, Pigtails, what's gotten into you? You hitting the sack this early? And he goes over to light the candle that has been sort of snuffed out. And while he does, he turns around back to the door and sees Emmy Lou Hartley. And she is putting a chair under the door so it can't be opened from the other side. She says, I'm leaving, Brett. And he's like, you're not leaving. And then she pulls out a knife and stabs him or slices his hand away from her because he he grabbed her on the arms and he then comes back with a punch in the face and a kick in the stomach and the two girls on the other side of the door are like what's going on what's going on in there and back inside the room emmy lou has been pushed up against a table uh where she grabs the oil lamp that has been sitting there and throws it to the ground starting the room on fire and the two other girls are on the other side trying to to get the door open and uh, but they can't obviously because of the chair uh and in, back inside the room while uh brett is distracted by the fire starting she emmy lou throws a chair through the window and uh runs out they finally get the or brett pulls the chair away from the door and they get the door open and brett tasks the two girls with stopping the fire while he goes after emmy lou and we see emmy lou riding off into the distance uh, on a horse. So hopefully she can get away. Meanwhile, 
uh, Jonah Hex has presumably killed the cougar, and he is now banging on the door of a building. A man comes, a man with a corncob pipe who looks a lot like either Sam Elliott or Mark Twain or both. Uh, and, man, he does. Now that I say that, he looks a lot like Sam Elliott. That's crazy. That's, wow, that's a really weird coincidence. Um, and the the guy says, well, uh, holy thunder, mister. You, what have you been up to, making love to a grizzly bear? And, which is very funny. Uh, but it, it, it was a, it was a mountain lion, actually. And, uh, Jonah Hex basically says, hey, I just, I need a horse so I can ride back into town and get... And get to a doctor. Uh, the man offers to to you know mend his wounds, but Jonah Hex says no, no, no. I'll just go to a regular doctor. Uh, I know one. He knows me quite well. I get hurt very often. And uh, Jonah Hex gets a horse from the sky, who says just just slap her on the butt when you're done, and she'll come back. Which is like that's horses are so smart. They're just like yeah, this isn't my house. Let me let me go back to my house. Uh, so. Okay, so now this is the part of the comic, this is the part of the issue that gets confusing for me. And maybe it's something that's referenced in earlier issues of Jonah Hex, or it's something that'll be referenced later. But there's a moment right now that has to do with the title of this issue, and is and Jonah Hex kind of brushes it off like it's nothing. So, Jonah Hex is riding in the rain, and he's like, up ahead there, or thar, what in the f- furry blazes is that? And he looks up and he says, it's the brightest North Star that he's about to say that he's ever seen. But suddenly a beam comes out of it. He says, holy Hannah. And the beam shoots past Jonah Hex back towards, uh, he says, if and if and that ain't the weirdest, wait a minute, ain't that, ain't that the same spot where that old farmer was standing? And he looks back and he says, no. Guess not. He must have went back inside the house. Good thing for him, too. That shooting star would probably have frightened the poor galoot half to death. So I don't know if it was a shooting star or if there was like some sort of beam or something. But Jonah Hex kind of brushes it off like, oh, this is just normal. Which, maybe. Uh, I don't know if Jonah Hex really does deals with a lot of supernatural space stuff. Maybe this is Cowboys vs. Aliens before Cowboys vs. Aliens was a thing. But uh, but I guess it's fine. And if it did hit that old farmer, I guess Jonah doesn't really care, which is fair. He's got that very sort of Wolverine-like attitude. It's like, eh, whatever. Uh, we then cut to morning at the doctor's office. Uh, we see Jonah Hex sitting on a table. getting his. He's, all of his wounds are now bandaged. He's looking great. He's not. He's looking like he's worse for wear and the doctor makes a quip that maybe he should just have a full-time physician just traveling around with him all the time uh so that you know he doesn't have to keep coming back to the doctor's office and uh the doctor also says he has a telegram that arrived for uh jonah uh, from the sheriff's office uh so so if you'd want it he can have it and and jonah says thanks Uh, and he reads the telegram and it's the and it's the news that jeremiah hart has been gunned down uh, by uh, and he's cut off by someone saying "gun down by me, Mister Hex," and we see Silver Ames standing in front of him, and she says, "Silver Ames, the fastest gun the world has ever seen, and once I've outgunned you, the entire world will know it." And Jonah says, well, "You may be the fastest, comma girl, but ain't no way in creation you're gonna outgun me." And he and he then he goes on to critique her, basically a whole entire. Uh, technique. So, her gun, her gun belt's wicked low. It's not high up on her waist. It's down more like mid mid thigh. So he says you're gonna get an extra fifth of a second just to get your glove down onto the gun. So that's already that's already in in Jonah's favor that way. Uh, And then he talks about the front gun sight, uh, which is that if you've ever seen a, a a revolver. At the front is a sort of, I guess, kind of L-shaped piece of metal that is used as a sight, as the front sight. You line it up with the back sight, and that's where you're, what you're aiming at. Gunfighters back in the day would shave it off or file it off so that it doesn't get caught on the holster. 
so you could, you know, you're going to have a smooth pull out of the holster. And he says, yeah, that's going to get, one of these days that's going to get caught and you're going to get blasted and be dead meat. And then, and then he says, well, how about your stance? It's way too. And he's cut off and she says, shut up. And then she's like, on the count of three, Hex, one, two, and before she can even get to three, uh, Jonah has put two bullets in her chest. Because Jonah the Hex may be on the side of goodness, I guess. I've always thought of Jonah Hex, though, as an anti-hero, although that that is sort of a misnomer, uh, the word anti-hero. But he's a dude that is like, I'll, yeah, I'll kill people and I won't feel bad about it. But, I mean, most of the time it's with good reason. And, I mean, Silver Ames is a murderer, like a straight-up murderer. Uh, she has gone on a killing spree across the West. Uh, so is, should he be playing judge, jury, and executioner? No, but Jonah Hex doesn't really care. And, uh, he guns her down and then casually walks away. And that is the end of that issue of Jonah Hex. Uh, I've never, I never read any sort of Western, uh, comics. I'm obviously a very superhero focused guy, but Jonah Hex being one of the strangely only, um, cowboy western characters to really make that jump all the way to modern day. I mean, uh, All Star Western had a had a volume in the New Fifty Two back in two thousand eleven. So, like, I mean, that's that's thirteen years now removed, but still, I mean, Jonah Hex is still around and, and thriving. So I don't I don't know what makes him, you know, have this longevity. But I, I don't know. I mean, he's got a movie, for goodness sakes. It's not a very good movie, but, like, there's so many other superheroes and stuff that don't have movies, but Jonah Hex has a movie, and he is he's still around as just a guy who is a cowboy. So, there's something about Jonah Hex, I tell you. But that's going to do it for Jonah Hex number 90. Uh, so let's move on to the final issue of today's episode, Tales of the Legion number 322, released January 24th. 1985, shocker, cover date, April 1985. We have a couple debuts to the podcast on uh, on this one, in this issue. We have Brainiac 5, uh, Quirrell Docs, debuted in Action Comics number 276 on March 30th, 1961. I, you know, I learned something uh, doing, doing prep for this episode. I always thought Brainiac 5 was just always a part of the Legion. I, as, as you've heard in, in previous episodes, I'm not a huge fan of the Legion. I don't know a lot about the Legion. So I always thought that Brainiac 5 was just always around. But it, it, he wasn't. He comes much later than than the rest of the, the Legion of Superheroes. And then we also have Dawnstar, the uh, winged uh, super tracker of the uh, Legion of Superheroes. And she debuted in Superboy number 226 on January 20th. 1977. Uh, so let's talk about the production side of this issue. Uh, it was written by Mindy Newell, plotted by Paul Levitz, penciled by Dan Jurgens, the great Dan Jurgens, inked by Carl Kessel, lettered by Ben Oda, and colored by Carl Gafford. Uh, so let's talk about the cover. As always, as is tradition, it is is it says Tales of the Legion of Superheroes at the top because that's the title of the comic. Isn't that fun? And in the foreground, we have a what looks to be some sort of guard or, or something, and he has a big wound in his chest, and it looks like he is dead in, in this snowy landscape. Uh, standing behind him, like sort of half-shadowed, is Dawnstar holding a bloody spear. And then to the left in the background is two of the two other guys that are dressed, or three other people, that are dressed similar to similarly to the dead man in this sort of gold kind of shiny armor with a sort of uh, chest piece of a green fabric with a with an orange uh, cape uh, and orange gloves and boots and uh, gold helmets. And with them is Brainiac Five, and he's running towards Dawnstar and he's saying, "Dawnstar, what have you done?" So clearly, Dawnstar has done something. Uh, and we're going to find out what in this issue. So let's get into it. The issue starts, quote, somewhere in a place of exile, 2985 AD. 
Uh, Exile being the planet that Brainiac 5 and Dawnstar wound up on last issue uh, in Tales of the Legion 321. Uh, in their search for the lost Legionnaires who we saw return in Legion of Superheroes number 8 a few weeks ago, maybe a month ago. So they're on this planet, and this planet is based on a theocracy, which if you don't know what a theocracy is, it is a government based around a religion. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's an iffy. It's an iffy form of government. It's not my, I'm not a big, I'm not the biggest fan of theocracy, I don't think. Uh, that that should be a thing. So this is a theocracy-based planet, and this religious leader that we see on this very first full page of this issue is clearly the person in charge. They are uh, giving a speech to people in front of this large, intricate building with a lot of intricate details. There seem to be heads placed in in windows behind this person weirdly i see one that looks a lot like blue devil uh i don't i doubt it is blue devil but that'd be funny if that was just like a little like nod um i don't know if any of the creators here are involved with blue devil at, at all at all but back to the speech uh it is basically a speech telling uh or or getting the uh armed guards standing in front of this woman this religious woman uh hyped up about going out and finding one of their holy brothers, his novitiate, so novice and initiate sort of portmanteaued together, uh, novitiate, uh, and uh, who have been sort of taken into the service of a winged demon, who we find out is uh, Dawnstar, and uh, this has all been really twisted in, in terms of what is happening. So... She is sending out uh, armed armed guards or armed forces to find them. We then cut to Dawnstar, and she is standing uh, out on a really desolate wasteland while two figures sleep nearby a campfire. And she is uh, contemplating leaving or, or escaping because she is technically a prisoner because in the previous issue... Her wings were damaged, so she can't fly away. Because normally she's a very good flyer. She can, I think, fly in outer space, which is not how flight works with bird wings like she has. But she is an alien. Aliens work different. And the wings could be purely decorative, even though they're not. Because, like, you see one has a big hole in it from some enemies uh, yesterday who attacked her. Uh, Dawnstar is hoping that she can find either Brainiac 5 or his cruiser at the very least because she thinks there's a possibility that Brainiac 5 is dead uh, because they've been separated uh, through happenstance from last issue and uh, she's just hoping to get off-world uh, back to Earth, presumably, to the Legion headquarters. Uh, so she attempts to fly away, but... Her wings are just too damaged. She barely makes it, I don't know, a few yards into the, the air or a few meters in the air when she falls back and lands face first on the ground. When uh, a knife is pulled on her uh, by a redheaded woman in a white costume or a white outfit. And she thinks that she was trying to escape, which she was. Um, th th there's really interesting sort of lack of communication because for whatever reason Dawnstar and Brainiac 5 well maybe not Brainiac 5 he doesn't seem to have any problems Dawnstar at least doesn't speak the language of the people on this planet which I always thought that that was a, a thing of the Legionnaires that they have like some sort of universal translation but maybe maybe not maybe I'm mistaken I'm not an expert on the Legion as everyone knows um, but uh, she can't communicate with these two people, her captors, uh, so there's a lot of communication problems in this issue. Uh, her and this redheaded woman, they fight until the man who was previously sleeping uh, tells them to stop, uh, tells uh, the, the young woman in white who is named Ina, I-N-A, uh, to stop. And uh, Ina just says that she was trying to 
uh, stop her from escaping and reinforce that she's not in charge here. And the man who we learn is named Jodan, uh, J-H-O-D-A-N, uh, tells her to just forget it. Um, if, if you thought she was escaping, your proper action should have been to wake me up because I'm your, I guess, master uh, in terms of like your training and stuff like that. I don't know what they're training for, if it's for religious reasons or warrior stuff, I don't know. But uh, she is his novitiate, so she has to listen to him. And so she gets mad, and she's like, well, if I would have waited to wake you up, she would have been gone already. Uh, which then kind of pokes a hole in her story, because she said that her wings, or Ina t- said that her wings were too damaged to get away. So I don't know why, if the time mattered... You know, so she's clearly like, you know, poking holes in that. Um, but uh, Dawnstar, sort of listening through the tone of this, sort of realizes that Ina is in love with with Jodan, uh, her, which which happens in a sort of partnership like that. A, a teacher and pupil sort of situation happens all the time in in fiction and in real life. So, uh, but after Ina leaves. Uh, Dawnstar and Jodan sort of lock eyes, and uh, Jodan thinks that he's being bewitched um, by this strange woman with wings, uh, and and Dawnstar is feeling some some feelings as well. Uh, we then cut to another part of the planet. Uh, I don't think super far away, but uh, at least a distance, and we see. Brainiac 5, and I never thought of Brainiac 5 as being, like, uh, a muscle boy, a beefcake, if you will, but he looks frickin' ripped in this first shot and this and a second shot on the same page. Dude's got mad muscles. Uh, he is bathing in in a, in a stream uh, after after a night of sleep, uh, and he, he gets out, and there is a shot of him uh, without any clothes on, scandalous, and he can't find his clothes, and he finds them with his traveling companion who he has sort of connected with, or at least kind of not teamed up with, but is traveling with as a sort of a guide to the planet. His name is Spliff, which is just funny because that's like a weed thing. Um, but Spliff is sort of... Uh, Brainiac refers to him as having schizophrenia, as being a schizophrenic, uh, which, you know... That's a, a terrible um, mental disorder that uh, I wouldn't wish on anyone. Uh, but Spliff basically complains that Brainiac 5's clothes smell terrible. Uh, but Brainiac 5's like, well, I got to put them on because otherwise I am naked. Uh, after putting on his clothes, Brainiac 5 realizes that Spliff has kind of gone away. And so he searches through the forest a little bit and finds him in a sandy area uh, chanting, he's saying Cole, uh, K-O-L, which is the god of this planet. Cole is there, you know, Cole in heaven, Cole be praised sort of situation. He's like Cole, Ashanti, Dies Omni, Mana, Krishna, which is uh, which feels like a lot of like Hindu, or Hindi. Hindu is the person, Hindi is the language. Uh, it, it sounds like a lot of Hindi in there. Uh, and he's like uh, Mana, uh, Manata, Ma Kol Ramana Kol Ab Initio Ashanti Ashanti Ashanti, which I mean, uh, if you're gonna pick a '90s R&B singer, I mean Ashanti's not a bad choice. Uh, and he is drawing things in the sand, and Brainiac Five sees it and is like shocked because he sees nine concentric circles, so circles within each other, a a Greek symbol for man and woman so the circle with a cross or plus and a circle with an arrow and then uh, the binary representation of the number three and apparently all of those together means earth uh terra terra firma and so he thinks that spliff who looks just like a person but then again everyone on this planet looks like just like a human being which is a weird coincidence on in space it's just weird that so many aliens just look like humans uh, and in and, and spliff this whole time has just been you know chanting cola shanti mana coal and finum 
Uh, we then cut back to the Legion headquarters. Uh, this issue obviously taking place after Legion of Superheroes number eight, uh, which we have already been over because we see Element Lad and he is in the sort of control room of the Legion headquarters and he's talking to Dream Girl. Or Dream. What is, is it? Dream Girl? Is it Dream Lass? Uh, dream, 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 dream. Oh, they just call her like Dreamy. I think it's Dream Girl. Um, and he's, you know, it's like it's good to be back in command, you know. And she's like, good. I'm. I did not like being in command. Uh, when Wildfire bursts into the room, and you should know if you don't already, Wildfire and Dawnstar have a sort of platonic slash romantic sort of entanglement. Uh, with each other, they're in a sort of pseudo relationship um, kind of thing, which I don't know if is really possible because Wildfire is like contained within this suit, so I don't know how that works. But he is mad at Dream Girl because under her watch, uh, Brainiac Five and Dawnstar went out to look for the Lost Legionnaires, Element Lad and Chameleon Boy and um, Phantom Girl and. Um, the Ultra Boy, I think. Was he one of them? I can't remember. But he's mad, and he he storms out after, you know, yelling at them all. Uh, Dream Girl has sent out a message, I'm assuming through Dreams, uh, to Brainiac 5 and Dawnstar, and, and Element Lad is trying to do the same thing with uh, their communicators. So, so they're in the process of trying to bring them home, telling them that, hey, the Legionnaires are back. You can come home. Uh, but Wildfire is very angry at at them all for for those two going off on their own. Uh, we then cut back to Exile, the planet uh, where Jodan and Dawnstar are riding on a big kangaroo-looking thing, and Ina is is riding on one as well. Uh, and they are riding through the forest. They're heading back to the place that. We were at the beginning with the the speech because Jodan is returning Dawnstar to the authorities because she is a, a prisoner for whatever reason, and uh, they have to stop. And um, Ina is sent to go hunt because their their morning prayers did not bring mana, uh, M A N N A, which I don't know if is how it's normally spelled. I think it's normally just M A N A, which mana. In biblical terms, if you're not a, a person who's you know was raised in any sort of uh, Judeo-Christian church, uh, manna is something that the I believe the Jews prayed for during their forty days in the desert, or like their forty years. Sorry, forty years. I think it is roaming the desert, and it's basically just a food source that comes from the sky. So clearly, on this planet. There are some equivalencies. Uh, if you pray in the morning, food will, will come from the sky. So uh, Jodan blames this on uh, Ina's uh, behavior, saying that Cole is displeased uh, with how she acted this morning, and so she must go hunt for food. And while he is going to pray at this altar, and we sort of learn that these altars are placed every sort of five kilometers because it's a theocracy. Everyone's really, really into religion, so having numerous places to pray and worship is a must. So Jodan prays, and he does the same sort of chance. He says, Kol, uh, he doesn't say Ashanti, he says, Kol Ahanti Dies Omni Mana Krishna, uh, when suddenly a rumbling from the skies comes, and Jodan looks to the skies and says, Kol, no, I am still your loyal servant. And we then cut back to the city uh, that we were in previously. And the uh, the guards, the, the military forces, are they have been whipped up into a frenzy. Uh, they're like, death to the transgressors. Jo Jodan's blood will be on my sword. We are ready to serve Cole. Uh, and, and some people are trying to talk sense into the commanding officer, Rand, R-A-N-D, saying Jodan would sooner betray his own mother than Cole, or the core. And Rand says, be careful what you say, Uctio or, or Lictio. Your words could be taken as heresy. Because speaking out against religious organizations uh, in certain terms can be heresy. And that's frowned upon, typically, in, in, in to churches. 
So they are uh, going to go out and get him. And the religious leader, who we know is named Awian, A-W-I-A-N, uh, the Reverend Mother is what she's saying. She's saying, I hold the crystal of coal. Be aware I speak for him and rush to obey me. See the gathering storm. Our father is angry. He must be appeased. Ride out, children. Ride out and bring me the transgressor. And behind her is a, you know, dark clouds with a lot of thunder and lightning uh, crackling. So something, something's going on. So these military forces, they get on these similar uh, kangaroo sort of uh, horsey things. And they ride off to uh, get the transgressors who are Jodan and Ina and, and Dawnstar. And after giving this speech uh, and, and coming down from her perch, uh, Awian, is, it's time for her to hear the prayers uh, of, of the people. So, or the or news or something uh, about it. Uh, and so she, she talks to this man uh, and hears his prayer or, or uh, dreams. He, he talks about his dream. He said, I had a dream I fear was sent from coal, Reverend Mother, about a fish in the sky and it landed among the wheat fields and disgorged a man, but a man with green skin. And he stood there and laughed and cried. Reverend Mother, I am not done, but she has stopped listening because she's thinking it has begun. And we learned that it has begun means the time of the infidels. And presumably the fish coming from the sky and disgorging a man with green skin is Brainiac 5 landing on the planet with a cruiser, which, I mean, if we've seen space stuff, a lot of them look kind of fish-like, you know, uh, st streamlined and all, all that, even though that's really not necessary because space doesn't have air, you know, resistance. So... We then cut back to Brainiac 5, and he is still observing uh, Spliff uh, as he's doing this sort of chanting. And he's wondering, like, is Spliff a, a human being that got marooned on this planet? Uh, he, I mean, he seems to... He's, he's speaking my language, or he's speaking a language that I can speak, but Brainiac 5 can speak a lot of languages. And so he is he's confused about Spliff as a person, because he speaks in a lot of gibberish. When suddenly four-winged sort of snake things carrying a basket on a sort of harness, uh, fly over and drop the basket near Spliff and Brainiac. And inside are these sort of pink, um, I don't know how I'd describe them, um, uh, oh, like a cream puff looking, I guess, cream puff shaped at least, somewhat spherical, uh, but like soft looking things. They're pink. Uh, and this is apparently the mana, uh, so it must. It literally comes from the sky. It is delivered. It's like if you all you have to do to get Uber Eats is to pray, is just to chant Ashanti, 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 Taco Bell, and uh, they would bring you Taco Bell, but uh, they'd still charge you fees out the nose. So I would I would be careful with that. Brainiac Five then tries to kind of qu question Spliff or ask him questions about Earth, but. Uh, Spliff doesn't seem to, to understand or he doesn't answer the questions straightforward at all or at all. Um, and so that's that's not great. But we then cut to uh, time shift two days later when uh, when the three transgressors, uh, Jodan, Ina, and Dawnstar, are confronted by the armed forces that were sent out and they begin to attack and Dawnstar tries to escape. She starts to fly off. It's been two days, so there's a possibility that her wings are now healed enough to fly away. And she seems to be she seems to be able to fly, but she she says that it's too slow. And the the military men on the ground are going to start shooting arrows. And Joe Dan, meanwhile, is trying to make his case to to Rand and his forces that he was trying to bring Dawnstar back to to the to the core uh, because she is a prisoner. And so, you know, not like this, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a traitor. And uh, Dawnstar being the good person that she is, she, she, she flies up and is free and she can now find Brainy or at least his cruiser and she can, she can get out of here. But she cannot forget that she found a friend, kind of, a person who treated her nicely on this planet. He was kind and, and probably saved her life, 
but so perhaps she should make it uh, right because as she says legionnaires pay their debts so she sees Rand sort of getting the upper hand on Jodan and so she swoops down like she does a dive bomb like a peregrine falcon and kicks uh some one of the forces into the one of the armed forces into the trees and picks up a sword and says uh I do not care for this dishonorable rules of battle but if I must fight for my freedom and for his I will fight by your rules as she picks up a sword and uh Ina is grabbed by uh one of the military people uh while Jodan and Dawnstar continue fighting uh, Dawnstar is having some difficulty. Uh, one of the, the ones she is fighting is getting the upper hand when he sort of is about to lunge at her. She's holding her sword out and it stabs right through his chest. And she says, he tripped on and fell on my sword. I didn't do it. Uh, great spirit. He cannot be dead. I cannot have killed. I cannot, but I have. We then cut to a, I guess this would be a C plot because there's A, B, because a Bra- Dawnstar would be A plot, Brainiac would be B plot, and I guess this will be C plot. And uh, we cut to a man named, oh, what is his name? What is his name? It's like Mon something. Not Mon L. It's not Mon L. It is. Oh, it's not. It's not Mon. It's Dev M, uh, and he's a. Uh, must be a member of the science police and he is undercover on a strange planet uh, or base. I'll I'll read you the sort of caption box. It says last report from agent red sun indicated successful infiltration of dark circle, dark circle homeworld. However, there has been no further contact. This is no cause to assume the mission has failed. Red sun has proved adept at handling covert activities and that is from the interstellar counterintelligence court so red sun makes me think that dev m is a daxamite just like Monel, um and he's wearing a disguise to to look like a member of the dark circle and he is looking for a spot to send in a communication uh back to base about his activities undercover um and, and they're not going to like what he's uncovered about the dark circle and he thinks he has found a spot to covertly send his message. But we see at the in the final box of this page that four cloaked figures are watching him. And one asks, should we stop him? Another says, Dev M is no threat to us, nor is his science police contact. His own ego prevents him from suspecting that he's been monitored all this time. The ICC is playing right into our hands. Perfect. So presumably those are members of the Dark Circle, uh, which I'm assuming is a bad organization. Because otherwise, why would it be called that? Uh, back, We got back to Brainiac in uh, a village on Exile, uh, the planet Exile. And Spliff has brought him into a village from, from the forest. And he's brought the mana that he has collected uh, even though it's been two days. So is this new mana? Is this fresh mana? Or is this the same mana? I guess maybe it has a really good shelf life. Uh, that's That'd be cool. So he brings it and all the kids are really excited. They're like, yeah. When uh, someone is someone is shocked and sort of goes, aye, uh, because Brainiac's skin is green. And they, you know, someone says, oh, maybe he's just sick. Um, and someone says, Psh, be quiet. Maybe he'll leave. Um, And someone else says, but he came with Spliff. He must be okay. And uh, this big red sort of saber-toothed lizard with cat ears sort of thing uh, gives Brainiac a sniff and then a big slurp. And uh, this woman says, it's all right, stranger. Guzong, Guzong like you and Guzong's never wrong. You're welcome here. So uh, Brainiac has been has been welcomed into the village. Uh, because of a big lick. So uh, while everyone is distracted, uh, you know, or not paying attention to him anymore, he goes and investigates. And he goes to this building that he says uh, that looks interesting, different from the other architectural designs. And it's a a building with a sort of diagonal 
aligned door, so it's not a straight up and down rectangle. It's like a straight up and down rectangle, but it's been rotated 45 degrees, uh, which I guess is to indicate that we're in space, and this is an alien planet. And above it is a sort of sunflower-looking design. And Brainiac, or Brain, Brainiac 5 walks in and says, undoubtedly an altar to, of some kind, and this must be a temple to the local deity. So he thinks he's inside of a church, and he... Uh, he's thinking, oh, is it this coal that Spliff referred to? And he investigates this altar, and underneath, or he looks at the altar itself, and he sees that uh, part of the altar is built with alloys that require processes beyond those of what this society seems to be capable. This is not a, a an advanced, technologically wise society. Um, they're, they're probably, it's, I mean, theocracy are, are typically old sort of forms of government uh think middle ages uh stuff like that uh so and that's the kind of technology that they seem to have you know swords no guns uh, armor kind of stuff like that when underneath brainiac 5 finds a computer reel which is a disc with information on it um that you can play on a computer we cut back to the aftermath of the battle with Dawnstar and jodan and ina and Dawnstar is, is having a crisis because she has killed someone, which I am assuming she's made some sort of oath that she cannot. Maybe it's her 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 people who are nonviolent or who are pacifists who don't kill because she's you know yelling at herself. She's saying murderer, savage, blood, blood everywhere, and none of it mine. And Jodan comes up to her and asks her in his own language, so she doesn't understand any of it. He's like, what's wrong? You're not glad to be alive instead of cold on the ground? And she's thinking, I hate you. Because of you, I have murdered. How can I go home again? How can I face wildfire? And so Jodan grabs her and sort of shakes her and says, listen to me. Listen to my voice. I know you don't understand my words, but listen, you are not to blame. If blame must be shouldered, then let it be on me. I should have let you go that first night when I realized in my soul I could not bring you before Cole. And uh, they're kind of they kind of look in each other's eyes and they are inch, inching towards each other for a kiss. They're going to just go. But they are interrupted by Ina returning. She has escaped from the person who has who grabbed her in the previous scene, and she yells out, "Rand was right." I was stupid to believe in you. And Jodan says, Ina. And Ina runs away and says, you'll be sorry. You'll see. And Jodan is like, Ina, come back. You're still my novitiate. And she says, not anymore. It's a very sort of uh, Obi-Wan and Anakin sort of situation. Not that Anakin was in love with Obi-Wan unless you uh, read certain slash fiction on the internet. Uh, but uh, a sort of like, I'm not your padawan anymore uh jodan says oh i must i gotta go stop her uh before she gets word to uh, uh we in uh but dawnstar notices that he is injured and uh sort of i guess pantomimes that she's gonna bandage him up and um we see ina sort of watching the scene after storming off as she's sitting on top of her kangaroo sort of horse thing um, and she's, she rides away and she's thinking to herself, I loved him, but my teacher preferred the spell of that, witch. I'll show them I'm going back to the Reverend mother and then they'll be sorry. We then cut back to Jodan and, uh, Dawnstar and he is saying, or he's trying to make it clear that, uh, I hope that Dawnstar isn't mad at him, uh, for his impulsiveness, but it seemed the only way to tell her how he felt that he doesn't think that she's evil or a witch or anything. And uh, Dawnstar is thinking, maybe my tracking powers led me here for a purpose. Perhaps here, with him, I could have the life I could never have with Wildfire. I'm assuming one with physical touch and intimacy like that. And then we get a sort of interaction between the two where they sound out their names so they each know what to refer to the other one as. And he's like, Joe Dan. And she, is, she says, Dawn Star. Uh, and Dawnstar says, or not Dawnstar, Jodan says, come Dawnstar, there is a village not too far from here, we can find shelter. 
Uh, obviously, she only understands the part where, where, where it's her name. Uh, but but still, um, he is taking her to a village. We then cut back to Legion headquarters where Dream Girl is stomping, stomping through the Legion headquarters. And she is she's like, I need a bath. My hair is so dirty and my nails suck. And I haven't felt this grungy since those Durlins waylaid us and caused me to miss poor Karate Kid's wedding to Projectra, which R.I.P. Karate Kid, that dude's dead. Uh, and that was back in LSH, uh, so Legion of Superheroes, annual number two. Uh, and, and she's thinking, reminded us all that accepting Legion responsibilities is a lifelong commitment, forever interfering with our private lives. At that moment, she is stopped in the hallway by Thom, uh, otherwise known as Starboy, or Star Man. He should be Star Man at this point. He's got a full beard. Uh, it's really a Star Man situation, but I think he's still called Starboy. And Starboy's like, hey, I got us a, a table at Crab Nebulae. Uh, come on, Galactic, Galactic Gourmet said it uh, gave it rave reviews, said the atmosphere was only surpassed by the seafood. And he's like, get dressed and we'll go. I've got an air taxi on the way. And uh, Dream Girl uh, yells at him and says, look, Dom, I don't need this Sir Galahad routine. So why don't you stop patronizing me? When are you going to grow up anyway? Learn to look beyond your own needs. And she stomps off. And one of the flying sort of computer assistants of the Legion flies up to Thom and says, uh, so I take it you will no longer need the air taxi? And he says, sigh, no, how about a game of hollow checkers, Computo? So I'm going to play some checkers with a computer. Uh, we then cut back to Exile uh, to Brainiac 5, and he is sort of still thinking about this this desk, or not this desk, this disk, this computer reel. And he's thinking, most interesting, the markings are Terran in origin, yet not of this century, but they do match those of artifacts dating from the Great Wars. Uh, and so so I don't know what the Great Wars are. If, if I hope he's not talking about like World War One or World War Two, that'd be crazy. Uh, but I mean, there is uh, one thousand years, so great wars, numerous great wars, it could have happened in a thousand years. When he hears a commotion outside uh, while thinking this, and he rushes to the square, and he thinks that possibly the the mana that he ate is uh, hallucinogenic, because he could swear that one of the two figures standing in the middle of the commotion is Dawnstar, and it is. It, Dawnstar and Jodan are standing there, and all the people in the village are, are bowing, like deep bows with like he heads to ground, arms on the ground, uh, on their knees. Uh, so something something's going on. But then it says at the bottom, to be concluded next issue. So this, this storyline will be concluded in Tales of the Legion 323, uh, which we'll get to uh, when we get to it in, in a while. Uh, but that was Tales of the Legion. Hopefully it made sense to you. Obviously, uh, Legion of Superheroes has a lot of backstory in its own sort of uh, universe uh, aside from the regular DC one. So uh, hopefully that all made sense. Uh, but that is going to do it for Legion of, Tales of the Legion of Superheroes uh, number 322. And that's also going to do it for this week's episode of Issue by Issue Crisis. Uh, as always, uh, hit us up on the socials, Instagram, threads, Twitter. I'm contemplating starting a YouTube to get the, the episodes on YouTube. If you're more of a, I like to listen to it on the computer uh, while I'm doing other stuff. Uh, if you don't want to wear headphones or whatever, I just think maybe that'd be a way to give, make it accessible to more people. Who knows? Uh, I might get around to that sometime soon. As always, you know, rate and review iTunes, Spotify. I gave a whole spiel last week, so, you know, whatever. And especially last Friday, last episode of Crisis. I don't know if I deserve your ratings and reviews, you know. But, uh, but yeah, uh, that's going to do it for this week's episode. Uh, as always, I am your host, Nick Byers. And uh, see you around. <laughs>